All right, as we uh, have people continuing to come in, we want to just get started here. Uh, we've got a, an hour and a half of what we think is going to be a, a really good discussion, not only amongst the panelists, but also amongst the audience. So uh, welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Andy Rash. I'm the general manager of our U.S. Uh, pork business for Alltech. Um, we've got a, a group of panelists here that I think if you read their biographies uh, and just their backgrounds and their investment uh, that they have in terms of digital technology, you're, you're going to see this shape up to be a great discussion uh, in, in how digital technology applies uh, to animal agriculture today you know and tomorrow so uh, good discussion we're hoping amongst the crowd here I know it's going to get interactive at the end so again thank you for joining us we're going to start with a short video and then we'll hand it over to our host and CEO Dr. Mark Lyons the world has never faced this size population every day between now and 2050 it gets harder to feed the world the challenge now going forward is how to not just feed the world, but how to nourish the world. We already have a changed climate, and we're going to have to change agriculture to keep producing food in that climate. Everything we do as farmers and ranchers has either compounding positive effects or cascading negative effects. We're going through this massive agricultural revolution. The next 30 years are not just the most important 30 years there have ever been in the history of agriculture. They're the most important 30 years there will ever be. Agriculture has to be part of the solution of what the world looks like in 10, 20, 50 years from now. If we do agriculture well, climate problems go away. They absolutely go away. It's all of us working together striving for better. That's how we're going to contribute to being a planet of plenty. Thanks for being with uh, us. This is something a little bit different for us this year. Uh, typically, we're bouncing between our booth and our, our place outside. I'm going to move this down a little bit. Um, and uh, and th today we decided to do something a little bit different, bring together a pretty interesting panel uh, of experts, of people with different ideas, and I think really get things going in terms of technology. It's great to see many familiar faces. Um, and I think what you just saw there um, is really what we try and bring together, the mission and vision of Alltech, which we call working together for a planet of plenty. And so that working together piece is very much what we're trying to do today. Um, we are taking our, our one conference, we traditionally have it in Kentucky in May, and we're taking uh, pieces of it around the world this year, uh, doing something a little bit different. We had a great session in Budapest. We have some friends uh, over from Hungary uh, with us here. Uh, in fact, the gentleman whose uh, fault it was that we ended up in, in Hungary is in fact here. Uh, we're going to have another stop in Dublin uh, just a uh, little bit later. Gosh, what are we down to, 10 days? Uh, in 10 days time. And so a little bit what we wanted to do today was bring some of those themes and those ideas here and talk about uh, some of those topics. So in that video, what we try and do is, you know, these are really the stories of so many of uh, those involved in agriculture. And we try and communicate our story um, and, and our, our mission and vision through their stories. Uh, and so that's really where uh, Planet of Plenty uh, has, has come from. We'll just move this ahead. We have to click on the slide. Um, and it's really, really down to this. We believe that agriculture has the greatest positive uh, potential, have a positive impact on the future of our planet. And you heard it there in many different ways, many different voices saying essentially the same thing. We can solve many of the challenges that we have uh, through better food production, better nutrition, uh, new economic opportunities, and certainly re revitalizing um, our, our um, environment and replenishing our environment. And so. Um, I may just give up on this. Uh, really, when we think about it, agriculture has two of the most important jobs in, in, in our world, nourishing our populations and also protecting our planet. And that, of course, is also a major responsibility. Um, it's a very significant responsibility, but also a tremendous opportunity for us all. And so I think that's a little bit what we should try and see in the optimism that we should have uh, through our conversations today. And so, in many regards, you know, we're achieving this planet of plenty and this, this mission um, through partnerships, through working with our customers. I think I may just have you do them for me. 
And, um, and in this regard, you know, all tech at this, at this size, at this scale, 43 years into our history, really has grown into being a global leader in agriculture. We work across uh, all areas. We really try and meet our customers where they want uh, us to be. Um, obviously, the business began in that animal nutrition, uh, the, the key nutrients, but now uh, we've, we've grown into having our premix business, our feed business, and of course the biological side as well, which really gives us an opportunity to, to look at this in, in a holistic way. Some of the individuals on that video are doing just that, um, really moving into what we today call regenerative agriculture, uh, which in many regards, I think is many of the activities that we've been involved in uh, for, for decades now. So as a business, having that opportunity to work on the crop side and the animal nutrition side allows us to start to think about soil, soil science. This is an area I find very exciting, very interesting, uh, and the potential really to be using uh, our agricultural systems, not just for production of nutri nutrition, but also potentially to be producing energy, to be also capturing carbon. And so this is a big part of what we see as the future. But it's the metrics, it's the analytics, and truly it's the technology, uh, the, the theme that we have today, that's gonna bring all that together. So, um, so when we look at that, um, what we've done today, can you go ahead, um, is bring together a, a pretty expert panel. I'm gonna ask them to come up now. Um, and we're gonna run through a few major themes. Um, and so I think what we'll probably do, Riaz, maybe you can kick us off. Sure. Um, and we'll just do, I think, some self-introductions. Uh, Microsoft is a great partner of Alltech, has been a partner for a long, long time. Um, so it's really special to have you here. And I think the first time you've been to World Pork Expo. Yes, and first time to this part of the world. Okay, excellent. Uh, so uh, I'm Riaz Pishori. I am a research program manager in Microsoft. I have been at Microsoft almost 29 years. Most of my journey has been on the product side. So I've been in Windows 20 plus years and few other products. In the last few years, I moved into research, working with uh, researchers. So these are all computer science experts, PhDs, in and looking at technology, how it can solve some of the hard problems in various industries from agriculture to food to sustainability, energy, finance. So it's excellent to have, I think, the insight from such a big business. Um, Microsoft has a big focus on agriculture. Um, in fact, we had uh, one of your colleagues out earlier this year um, really thinking about how we can leverage that technology. Um, so it'd be great to get your insights. Vijay. Uh, yes, uh, my oh, name Sorry, um, we have a video though. Oh, go oh, ahead. Yeah. About that. The world has a food problem, but it is not just about growing food. We need to grow good food, nutritious food, and we need to grow that food without harming the planet. One of the most promising ways to address that problem is that of data-driven agriculture. That is, if you could capture data from the farm, from different parts of the farm, and then use artificial intelligence on top of that data to add value, to be able to predict things that you otherwise cannot sense, cannot measure, you can then use that to improve efficiencies in agriculture. My name's Andrew Nelson. I'm a fifth generation farmer in Eastern Washington. We farm about 8,000 acres. In order to enable precision agriculture, a farmer needs to know what the farm looks like. Not just what's above the soil, also what's below the soil. One way to create that view is if you can bring data from sensors, if you can bring data from satellite imagery, from drone imagery, using artificial intelligence and computer vision techniques, you can merge all of these different data streams to create views of the farm that you otherwise just couldn't get. With one drone flight, we can generate 15 to 20 gigabytes worth of data. And we're able to see the data that comes back immediately. I'm starting to have self-reinforcing loops. I can take a drone flight, it'll inform my spray decision, which I can then see results from my weather station and field. And I can manage my field in a much more granular approach. I'm going from managing things field by field to managing it acre by acre, or even in smaller increments. The supply chain industry and the wind and solar energy producers would love to know, you know what the solar predictions or the wind predictions would be, where some of the microclimate predictions could sort of help them solve that problem. 
These are all fundamental computer science challenges where we as computer scientists need to work together with the other scientists in the space. So technology can help with climate adaptation and technology can also help with agriculture becoming a solution to this problem. We are confident using some of the technologies that we are building that we will be able to overcome this challenge. So fantastic, yeah, Dr. Chandra there um, as well, um, who, who was with us. So, BJ, maybe yeah. an introduction for you. Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is BJ Brugman. I'm the co-founder and CEO of uh, uh, Distinct. We're a precision livestock farming company. Really consider ourselves uh, the foundational layer of precision livestock farming today. The product that we uh, primarily market is an internet-based uh, smart alarm system. Um, I think this is maybe my 10th pork expo. <laughs> Um, and uh, excited to be here. It's great to be in a full room. I, uh, I was reading an article uh, on Monday that talked about the definition of velocity, and I thought, wow, what a great, uh, what a great uh, message, I think, for us. Uh, the author of this article defined velocity as the rate of new learning multiplied by the application of those learnings. And I thought, man, what a great theme for the week for all of us learning new things really, really quickly. I haven't been around at all. I know the show just started, but there's a lot of new things and a lot of you here obviously looking to learn new things. And, and I think the goal for all of us is go out and apply those as quickly as possible and drive velocity. That's awesome. That's a great definition. I'm definitely gonna lift that uh, and use it. Brad, great to have you with us. Yep, thanks. Uh, it's an honor to sit up here today and talk about this. It's uh, been a a passion of ours is as we've looked throughout the years on you know what's this industry lacking and, and, and labor is a big one so how can we how can we supplement uh, our labor constraints uh, with technology so uh, been something I've been passionate about throughout my 14 years in the industry and, and uh, continue to, to see incredible gains going forward with that. Thank you. And Jamie, we're going to be talking about sustainability uh, a few times, I think. So wonderful to have you with us representing um, Pork Board. Thank you. Um, Jamie Burr uh, was actually raised in the pork industry. Uh, I was raised in what used to be called the feeder pig capital of the world in southern Missouri, where my great uncle and uncle and grandfather owned a sale barn from 19, the mid-1950s through 2004. So been in, been in the pork industry my entire life, spent 24 years prior to coming to the pork board with Tyson Foods uh, in various environmental and sustainability roles. And now I get the opportunity to really um, amplify the producer's story around sustainability. Awesome. And Dale, thanks for, thanks for being with us. Uh, yes, uh, Dale Stevemer from Easton, Minnesota, uh, Miami. Uh, diversified producer there, uh, corn, raised corn, soybeans, um, finished pigs, about 2,000 head finishing on, on site. Um, recently started also harvesting the sun through um, a solar panel setup that will supplement, um, it's projected to supplement everything that I, that I use on the farm during the year, including the, the grain setup. And um, for two years I've been a member of the National Pork Board. Um, which has really expanded um, my knowledge of the pork industry and, and, and the needs and the desires of, of the producers. Um, during that time, I have been able to, to spend a lot of time um, working with this, some of the sustainability task forces, um, working to, to develop some of the, the measurements of the weak hair metrics that we have, and um, very happy to be here and, and talk about things. So you can see we've got a, a really nice lineup, of uh, diverse perspectives um, and experiences. And before we delve right into the technology, um, we kind of teed this up for you, but I don't know if we fully are going to get fully fledged answers. We just thought to break the ice, Alltech does have a beverage business, uh, and so we thought we'd bring that in. Uh, you'll see some of that uh, out in the tent a bit later. Um, and hopefully this doesn't make us too hungry if you do too good a job. But we were going to ask our panel what their favorite pairing was uh, of a pork dish and, uh, and a drink. I'll just kick it off. I think the pork tenderloin is the most underrated uh, meat probably in the world. Uh, it just doesn't seem to garner the price uh, that it should and uh, my wife is very good at, at preparing that. And my job at home is the drinks. So uh, a maple bacon old-fashioned uh, with the pork tenderloin would be where I would go. So uh, Ribs and beer. 
ribs and beer. That you can't make that much more simple, direct, and uh, I think already a winner. Yeah, uh, I think I have uh, I have a neighborhood that's really close, and they, I have a new patio, so they really like to come over to my patio. And I bought I bought 40 packages of pork burgers last week. I think it's 160 pork burgers. So I have to say that, and I will serve them bush light. <laughs> Yeah, I um, have to go with a, a smoked chop and then a, a good smoky bourbon there. Nice. I'm going to have a three-way three -way pairway, and that's, you know, uh, pulled pork, a cold beer, but with, with friends cooking it together and letting it smoke overnight and spending time together. That's my three-way trifecta. Pairway. Yep. Um, and I'll go a little bit higher class, but I'll do a crown roast. Cooked to 140, <laughs> <laughs> and an old-fashioned. Nice. OK, well, I, I kind of want to adjourn and just roll into that. But, <laughs> um, so just to kick things off, we're going we're gonna to go through a couple of different sections here. So really, when we start maybe just thinking about technology, um, you know, we, I think it would be good just to step back and assess what's actually being used today. Um, you know, Riaz, you've got, and, and, and I think there's, a, there's something we'll tease out here, and you can see it in your video. You know, there's so much happening actually around the area of technology, but it seems like kind of the, the, the crop side of things has run ahead. In animal agriculture, what type of technologies do you see today? And um, you know, maybe just to set the scene in terms of where we are. I think our, I mean, in terms of application of technology, the, the distinct story is uh, a little different. My, my background was in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, I'm, I'm from Iowa, spent a lot of time uh, um, on the East Coast and working with producers, in North Carolina, Virginia. Um, so got to understand some, you know, hog production uh, better through the pharmaceutical industry. And, and so my lens was really the, the desire for producers, customers I was working with to get visibility of their facilities in real time. Um, I think every, nobody would, or probably anybody would argue that there's a lot of data. Um, I think the, the reality was uh, we were lacking the information that we could take action on immediately. Um, and the company that I was working with, you know, we had some tools like that, but it was all retrospective. Um, and so we launched, uh, launched Distinct um, really with this idea that uh, we were going to solve the inventory problem. We were going to get the, the count exactly right. We thought that was the most critical thing. Uh, brought that out to the market uh, with technology. It worked. I mean, and I'm sure there are other companies around here that are doing that now, um, using artificial intelligence to identify and count animals. And other industry, other species are doing that. Um, what we found was a complete lack of infrastructure when we got out to the market. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think that forced our business to change and, and sort of, I think, <clears throat> the reality of uh, the nature of the, of the pork business hit us in the face, you know, where we said, okay, the technology's sexy, uh, you can win pitch competitions, you can talk to investors about something sexy like this, but you get it out to the farm, there's no internet. There's no, there's no infrastructure by which to start building on top of that. And, and so I think, I think for the swine industry, um, you know, look at, compare that to the row crop space and, and what happened with, uh, you know, a company like John Deere. John Deere launches uh, uh, guidance. That was the first thing. Guidance came and everything else kind of just snowballed on top of that. I think there's opportunities like that for the livestock industry, but we have to we, we had to, Distinct had to, step all the way back and say, okay, if we're gonna bring really cool things, really sexy technology that you know, not only can get everybody in a room excited but also has practical application, let's solve the, the, the infrastructure problem first. Start building that way and make, make the, uh, like take friction away from adopting new technologies. This is how we, we see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's there's been a lot of a uh, lot of great things coming out, you know. But uh, right now, I think one thing that's lacking in this industry is an all-encompassing unit. You know, we we use bin monitoring, we use alarm companies, um, but but is there something out there that just does everything all at once? Um, that's been a challenge that we've had, and then then implementing to a scale, um, like BJ mentioned, you know, running out to these farms where we don't have internet, you know, we we can't even get a cell phone signal, um, has been a been a challenge that, that we've definitely encountered as we've been looking at these different technologies. Um, I think that the the data uh, sending and receiving, um, we've we've had some good leaps and bounds here over the last couple of years. Um, but there's still definitely more to, more to come to be able to roll out a lot of this technology on a full scale. 
And that's actually, I, I think when Dr. Shem was with us, he was talking about something Microsoft was doing, using like the, the television? Yes. So I was, sorry. That time, that time. No, exactly. <laughs> um, so uh, Dr. Chandra started looking at agriculture and saying, what are the problems in agriculture in 2014, right? And sort of just looking at how technology can help solve the problem in, in various industries, like agriculture was the first that he looked at. And so he started looking at if there was data, how do you even get that data? And that mm -hmm. goes back to, you know, BJ, your situation, like connecting that data and getting that data to even do something with it, you need to uh, be able to send that data somewhere for processing. And so he started looking at, you know, the unused TV channels. Mm -hmm. So especially in the rural area where there is not that many TV signals, then you have a lot of available unused TV channels. And the idea was, instead of sending TV signals, can we send data over that? Now we know that TV signals go long distance. So, so if you could sort of send data over long distance, given the, that could help solve the connectivity problem. So that was the first stage of sort of looking at how to unlock uh, some of that data. Um, now, also there are other research of saying, hey, can I even take now, now given the satellite is getting prevalent for connectivity, can we take the data and send it via satellite to, to, to sort of get that data? And I think the other point that Brad was sort of referring to in a, another angle was the fact that a lot of these data is in silo, right? And sometimes some of these data used together can give you more insights, and that might be another angle to sort of look at. Historically, Microsoft has been looking at, you know, the, you know, ERP systems and other systems, right? Uh, but sort of this sort of trying to look at how can technology uh, be applied in some of the other uh, use cases. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Does the pork board, you know, maybe both of you might have insight in this. Um, did, is, is it looking at that connectivity barrier or, or is there other infrastructure that we, that we need to be putting in? So I'll, I'll answer with this. One is, you know, we have developed systems and are developing systems, and I'll let you take one of sure. them and I'll take the other one, but um, the WeCare um, platform that we call it the WeCare application where we're taking data from farmers through um, the sustainability environmental consultants on the farm and, and feeding it into the WeCare application um, and then the, the long-term plan there is to use that data to tell producer story because we don't have that data today to tell the story. We have to depend upon models that are developed by others in order to tell that story. And we really need that, that data to be able to tell that story. Not, Dale, you can talk about AgView. Yeah. yeah, and I, I knew that's where you're going to team me up on. And, and, <laughs> and the AgView is, um, is on, on, you know, National Pork Board really didn't go in this to be a software company at all, but we ended up developing a very power, powerful piece of software that all producers can use to, um, to, to be able to record movements of animals, site to site, and then site to, to market. You know, at, at, and, the, and the real important reason for this is in, in case of a foreign animal disease outbreak, um, that data will be able to be submitted right to the, the appropriate animal health um, at organization at your state. So, so at that point, um, it really facilitates, um, uh, the producer doesn't have to do any more work because they've got, they've got plenty of other things on their mind right at that point. And then also the, the state vets have um, information at their fingertips and the combination of all the farms at that point and all the movements in that area, they get a lot better sense of what's happened um, some of the first things that happened in 2014-15 with the um, avian influenza out, outbreak, three ring binders were coming into the state vets re with their movement recording. We're at a point now where we can be a lot better, but what it also takes is it takes that movement information from producers to be entered. And then it becomes, then it becomes a very powerful tool. And maybe just building upon that, you know, I think if we think out five years from now, where do you see that type of system? And maybe just for, we could roll through everybody, you know, kind of giving us a good set of, of where we are today, but where do you think we're going to go? Um, you know, the, the basic movement data um, right now, Pork Board is 
fully supportive of that. It had, and it needs to be available for all producers from show pig, breeding stock, and, and large integrated systems. That, that whole spectrum, this, this program is available for. There's, there's the potential to do disease monitoring, the potential to do regional or, or uh, larger, even nationwide um, eradication of certain diseases if, if there's enough coordination and, and, um, and, and cooperation from, from producers. So, so the, I mean, that's, that's the pie in the sky one. Yeah. But, it, but we know that that could happen. That could be a tool that would get us there. And, I, and I, I envision over the next five years being able to take basically from the farm gate all the way through processing, taking all of that data and being able to roll it up and report it regionally to where if a consumer wants to know if this port came from this part of the country, this is that footprint. Or these are the attributes that, whether they're social attributes, whether they're environmental attributes, this is the attributes that came with this port that I have bought. I, I, I do want to mention one thing. I, I don't want us to lose sight that there has been a lot done in the past too, okay? So if you think about it from a genetics perspective, if you think about it from a feed perspective and how, and no, you didn't pay me to say that, just so we're clear, but <laughs> <laughs> um, there's been tremendous improvement in feed conversion over the past, ever since we started raising pork. But if you think about it, my career in the past 25 years in my professional career, Feed conversion was at a 3.5 or so in pork. Today, it's at a 2.7. So think about all of the positive benefits per pound of pork that that brings, whether it be less fertilizer, less land, less chemicals. So it, it, we've got to be careful not to, to lose sight that the rear view mirror is smaller than the windshield, but we still need to make sure that story is told. Yeah, we're always measuring from today forward, yeah. and we need to be looking back. I think that's a really important point. Yeah, and I, I don't know what the, the system necessarily is, whether it's AgView or, or something else out there, but, you know, in my vision, there's something that's tying in the GPS movement. It's, it's tying in the performance. It's it's making that phone call to the, the field staff or the vet saying, hey, I think we've got sick animals here trying to to make it so that we can manage larger larger herds um, and, and just rolling all the way up into to the production performance and accounting. And BJ, I may ask you to go a little bit deeper on this because um, you know one of the things we talked about before is everybody's kind of coming out with an app or they're mm -hmm. coming out with you know a single point. And Brad kind of mentioned it. And you can kind of hear the the frustration almost coming in there that everyone's kind of pitching these ideas. Is that something that's going to be solved in the next five years? And is that what basically is, allows us to tap into all this data? Yeah, I think. Well, I think kind of piggybacking off your point is if that future exists where we have everything end to end, it has to be digital. It has to be. Mm -hmm. I think, and if we survey ourselves, think about how many times, how many pieces of information across multiple farms, across large organizations, pieces of vital information, make it on a sticky note. You know, make it on a sticky note that a, a federal reporting requirement gets passed on a sticky note. And, and, and I, we always chuckle to ourselves. I think, I think there are some kind of funny things about just being a farmer. And, and so, but like, if that future is going to exist, it has to be digital. Uh, and so I, I, just, I think it's so exciting to think about laying that groundwork, like laying the infrastructure now to rapidly, rapidly scale and, and deploy precision technology. And my future vision for that would be five years from now, the row crop people are sitting in their meeting saying, how in the world did this happen? Like we led the way. Yeah. And, and, and I think it starts with, we have to have the vision. We have the vision, which is end to end. We know everything about every animal, about every farm, about all of our employees, about our whole team. We know everything that's going on. But I, I think what the industry has been plagued with a lot, to Brad's point, is individual point solutions um, that have individual value to one level of the organization. And we, we ran into this problem at, at Distinct as well. We would get in uh, a boardroom with the whole production team and uh, every, you know, someone would say, well, what should I pick? What should I pick? What should I pick? What should I pick? And you walk away and nobody picked anything because it was just a fight of what should we, what should we do? You probably experience this oh, yeah. every, every day. And so no decision was made. Uh, and and that's, that's obviously not driving us forward. So I, I, I just think the future is, of course, digital. Um, and laying that infrastructure today and, and taking the steps today to, to do that, thinking, you know, thinking what five years from now, I will want to ask more questions of my barn than I'm asking today. Thinking about that when you're making decisions 
you know, as you start to deploy technology or pick partners, uh, you know, building building on that digital platform. Yeah. Yeah, and that's so all I'll add to you know PJ's point here that we have sort of started in that journey, right? The Microsoft announced two months back a platform called you know Azure Data Manager for Agriculture, and the idea there is to get all of the siloed data, including satellite and drone and other sources of data, together, so that you can build applications on top of it and leverage the different sets of data in in that uh, case. Five years down the road, I think there might be given GPT, chat GPT, mm -hmm. conversational way. Today, a lot of the knowledge, the, the, you know, the grower, producer has, right? But now if that knowledge could be augmented with some of the other data so that he or she can sort of make a better judgment, uh, is probably where we will go. And in fact, Dale and I were just talking earlier about AgView, right? And he's sort of today tracking the identity of the animal, but like even if you were tracking during the transport what the environment was and all that, you can get a lot more better value. And I think across the business value chain, there might be more, uh, more efficiencies as well as uh, you know, newer business models from that data. Mm -hmm. yeah, it seems as we get the data, we start to actually ask more questions, you know, more, more opportunities open up. Uh, but I think you know, it's interesting uh, Jamie, kind of what you, you gave us there is a vision of where this is going. But the big challenge, and if the future has to be digital, we're going to have some laggards. We're going to have some people that don't come along. So how do we, how do we uh, I suppose, motivate and inspire people to, to adopt this technology? Is there anything that, you know, from the pork board side that you guys can do around that? Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing is giving farmers confidence in their data not being passed on, their data not being passed on. So data privacy. And um, I think the best story that I can give is, you know, if you look at the data that we're starting to generate, I can't even go in and see the individual farmer's data. I can't go in and see Dale's data. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think we've got to prove that the data can be blinded and can be kept private and we aggregate it together and pull it through the supply chain so that it gives the confidence in the farmer to be able to do that. Because I think that data privacy is a huge, huge topic. How do you guys as a company deal with that? I mean, you're, you're getting the information. Is that something that comes up pretty quickly? On I think it comes up usually, I think, early in a, in a conversation with a, with a customer. And we're always, I, same, I mean, same approach. I think very straightforward with, with that, I, I think. Uh, you don't get you don't get a second chance probably at, at that um, you know so I think being being extremely extremely aware of uh, how personal and private that information is and and we've always been um, you know very straightforward with our customers that they're, they're of course the owner of the data um, and we're there to help them help them use that to make better decisions. So um, we're here at World Pork. I think last year or the year before was a record number of attendees. This year it might be a little bit down. And one of the reasons for that is our next topic, uh, economics. And so you know, we're in a moment right now where you know, there's some challenges uh, for the industry. I might start with you. you know, as a business, you guys obviously have to be thinking of the ROI. Is it worth investing in? Um, you know, in infrastructure, in a logistics industry or agriculture, you have to kind of justify, I suppose, uh, where you put your investment. So you need a certain ROI as a company to be able to develop these new technologies. But how do we balance that then with the user's profitability, um, especially I think when, you, when you're looking at an industry where these are investments that are maybe a little bit longer term? Right, and for, for us, the way we are thinking about it is if we are giving better precision uh, insights and precision you know, agriculture, if you will, that will help reduce the cost, right? And in fact, uh, you know, if I'll go back to the video where Andrew talks about that for him, you know, just putting less herbicide and less pesticide, like 30% saving today, and he sort of thinks that that can go even to two third Right, again, that is a saving that sort of helps uh, him reduce his cost, uh, and some of that would got pay, get sort of paid for whatever the technology being used. Again, we are infrastructure technology, we sort of look at partners to build solutions on top of 
on top of this data. So I mean, Altec and other customers can sort of build solutions that is make sense for for their customers. Yeah, I think uh, I was just thinking of a funny story about economics, and actually, Dr. Hammer's here. He, uh, him, and I, we we built this model uh, for a pharmaceutical product to uh, take to a customer, and we were saying, this is the opportunity, right? If you use this product, this is the opportunity. This is what it will do for you, opportunity in the future. Uh, we worked on this model just cra I mean, this thing is sharp, it's perfect. Take it, present it to the customer, go through it, and his response was, I, I can take cost savings to the bank. I, I can't do anything with opportunity. My banker doesn't care about opportunity, and I was like, "Oh, great!" And uh, <laughs> shut the uh, shut the laptop, and uh, I think we went for pie after that, maybe. But uh, I, I think that's the uh, finding ways to save cost at, at all times is important. And I think if you're not if you're coming in to your office without that, it's probably you're probably not getting that far. Um, but I, you know, that that was a good lesson for me too. Is just always in the back of their mind is opportunities important and thinking about what what this enables for the future but if you're not there today with a way to replace cost or save cost uh, it's tough to get much further and so we've tried to focus our product around how do we replace cost today because we know mm -hmm. today especially it's important yeah yeah replacing cost is, is absolutely pivotal um, the other piece that we look at is is there a way that we can reduce labor on this you know, can we can we optimize the mill so that, that we can run bigger batches or, or uh, coordinate trucks better so that that we can get more loads out? Um, I think has been a, a big piece for us uh, in looking at some of the technology that we've looked at. Appreciate the question because I think without that question we're kind of tone deaf mm -hmm. to to what the state of the of the, of the matter is. Um, so first for the producers in the room, I would encourage you. Around the fairgrounds, there's a QR code for you to take a picture and for you to start getting a, a weekly email. And I know not everybody wants a weekly email, but if, if you want to know what Checkoff is doing for you, scan that and you can get an update every week on what is, pork off, what is Checkoff doing for, for you. Um, you know, the sustainability is, is still a long play. There is still going to be the need for us to tell that story, but we've got to live in the moment today. Um, and a couple things that, that the Port Board's doing around this, one is really around just reviewing demand. You're gonna see a, a big blitz this summer going into grilling season um, with ribs and chops. Um, so trying to help overcome some of the demand issue. And then also, I think an important uh, project, there is the bright spot too is I think exports, but we're also embarking upon a project to, how does US pork compare to other countries that export pork as well? So we've, we're starting a differentiation analysis so that we can begin telling that story to our um, countries that import our pork as well. Yeah, and the economics one is, is tough. Um, you know, we, we've been through this battle a few times before and um, you just gotta gotta keep looking for the shining light. The, the shining light partly is exports. Um, we're working on demand, um, and I, I I'm, I'm kind of down because I listened to Dr. Meyer yesterday, <laughs> and that was a, that was a that was kind of a tough presentation to get through. But you know we're facing challenges, and and yet I, I remember the first couple of pork farms that I attended, and this was um, late 90s. And the theme for it was in, um, it was, I believe it's a Chinese word for crisis, oh, is, is yeah. you know, you, you, you got opportunities, this is basically the same word. And so keep your head up, look for help, don't be afraid to talk to people because other pork producers are in the same boat. Yeah. I think, yeah, it is, we, we use that a lot, the crisis opportunity. Um, it's essentially a slightly different meaning yep. um, in, the, in the same word, but it is, it is that type of thing. But, I, you know, back into the camp bank opportunity, um, I think that's kind of an interesting uh, concept. And I just kind of wonder if there's a role um, in this. You know, some of these are, are big investments. Um, and, and BJ, I don't know, when you go and pitch a project, 
I mean, do you almost need a banker with you? Do you need yeah. somebody to come and finance this? <laughs> it's not that expensive. I, mean, no. <laughs> I heard it's really expensive, <laughs> but highly valuable. Yeah, it's fun. It's the, I think the weird, like the startup perspective, you know, and, and, and you know, funding the company that way with outside investment, you, it's, it's a weird balance of like, I, I've started, I've gotten to know that side of, the, uh, that's a whole other side of the world. Like the, the group I know is this group, at the Pork Expo, who probably you know want to, I would say ten cents. That's ten cents per pig. Ten cents, but an investor wants ten billion. <laughs> you know, like, so like, I think there's a there's a balance that you that I like. Just my perspective of running a startup, trying to trying to strike is saying how do how does you know the the business that we're running uh, become an extremely valuable business? You 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 work for Microsoft. Right, people people look at iconic companies like that, and you say, how how does how does something like that, like what we're doing, spring up to be that? That's that that's sort of a, a you know pie in the sky vision, and then an investor wants to see how is this ten billion, and the producer says, how I'd rather have ten cents, you know, like a, a penny maybe. Um, so I, I think that's always just been like trying trying for us trying to balance uh, the expectations of one side of our you know our investor group, but also kind of, I think, iterating what, what the producer is willing to bite off. Like I mentioned, at, what is the next question that we want to ask of the facility or its contents and creating the value proposition around an individual thing. Um, and I think where, where there's been a problem as it relates to the deployment of precision technology, though, is individual companies focus just on the one individual thing rather than thinking holistically and saying, OK, if, if, if this was in place, it would lead to this which would lead to this, which could lead to this, and maybe then someday you buy Activision for 60 million or something, you know? So, <laughs> something like that. But I, I, so I think that, that's how we've just tried to approach it is take it off chunk by chunk. Yeah. And, and it seems like it's, it's a way easier pill to swallow when you think versus pitching, let's go to the moon. Like first walk around the block. Mm -hmm. Start it overly, strong ROI around that, and then keep, keep chunking it away. And, and is this something though, um, you know, that is, is there a certain size though of, cust of customer or a certain size of producer where this technology, where these technologies are, are useful? Um, and in, in that regard, I think that's one of the challenges with technology. Is this just, you know, a game for the big boys or is it something that, that everybody can participate in? Because you kind of need it from the, the national perspective, everybody to be in, especially as you start to talk about disease and, and things like that. Yeah. Um being able to 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 make these inv an investment, whether it's um, whether it was the, the yield monitor that also does the um, well, it might have to be an ag leader, but it it does the steering in the tractor and and controls rates and runs the planter and whatever else is going on, you know, so just kind of a magical black box that I don't need to know how it works. So it really does a good job, um, but that investment. Um, spread over a smaller number of acres is tougher to make, but I have to do it because every acre that of corn that I grow, every acre of soybeans I grow has to produce the most profit possible. So I have to, I have to really be monitoring those more closely so that, so that I can, I can, so that my bottom line, the total dollars is high enough. Mm -hmm. So it, it becomes one of those uh, tough balances and it, and it it takes it takes a sharp pencil, but it works. Yeah. So. I'll just add a you know in time as as technology develops more and more like let's take a cell phone who th who would have thought 30 years ago that everybody would have one or maybe even two cell phones in their pockets. <laughs> so I mean technology we 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 anticipate would become cheaper or more economical over time as it's as it's developed so that those that might be not able to right off the bat implement could implement later down the road. It, everything's a slow uptake. So. Yep. Yeah, and it, it, it is just, um, again, as, as we think about the, the economics of it, you know, you must have faced this in other industries too where, you know, there's, there's a certain threshold. And I think particularly what's interesting in agriculture is we are talking about businesses, but we're also talking about Family businesses, small businesses, individuals—again, um, maybe with a very different uh, banking setup. 
how, how have you guys seen you know, overcoming that? Because you almost have to see the technology, get people to start to adopt, and then I suppose the profitability for you can come in. Right, and in fact, uh, from research perspective, that's one of the areas that we are sort of exploring it. How can we democratize some of these things, right? Sometimes some of these sensors are expensive and uh, that sort of leads to not being able to get it into the particular you know, small holder uh, mm -hmm. situation. Then, so one of the things that we are sort of looking at, for, uh, for example, is you know, today for soil sampling, either you get a soil sensor that you put every uh, place in the farm or you send the soil sample to a testing lab, then that they test and get it. So one of the research that we are doing is, hey, everyone has a smartphone. Can we use the smartphone to, to sort of figure out what the soil quality is or the soil carbon in the soil or moisture in the soil? And then that sort of, we believe that things like that can democratize and get more folks to, to use the technology. Yeah, I think it's critical. And then over time, then obviously kind of a Moore's law. Right. Uh, democratiz democratization of that is huge. I, I think like everybody knows like probably that that person, that relative or that friend who can just do anything, like can just fix anything, could you know rig up anything, can put something together. And I think when we when when technology is democratized, look out, like it it can really go because people start to tinker. You know, people start to you, if, when you're not uh, you know uh, I guess confined to, I use this thing for this thing, but instead I could take something, the base, and start to get exactly what I want, answer the question that I want, deploy what I want to answer that question. There are some really smart people working out in the industry. We know them, right? We know them, let them tinker. And when, and when, when technology is democratized, look out. Yeah, it'll be exciting to see. Uh, how that happens. So we, we're going to switch on to um, sustainability because I think this is kind of a, um, you know, a big topic in a lot of different ways. And we might just start with that. Um, you know, we kind of presented Planet of Plenty. This is the way we view uh, sustainability in a really broad sense. So we think of it as it isn't simply, um, you know, as as we've talked about, um, you know, being less bad uh, in a, in a certain regard. You know, we want to be proactive, empowered. Uh, we want to empower our customers, and we want to be thinking about nutrition. We want to be thinking about economics. We want to be thinking about um, better outcomes, obviously, from an environmental perspective as well. But maybe um, from from the panel, uh, maybe somebody could kick us off. What does sustainability mean to you, and what do you think it means to the pork industry? Well, um, two things about sustainability, and, and one of them is the economic sustainability, and you know, being from a multi-generational farm, you know, obviously at, at that point, the, the, that portion of sustainability has been demonstrated. Um, the environmental sustainability, um, as Jamie re refer referenced, um, there's been leaps and bounds that have been made by, by pork production over the last 50, 60 years. Some of it's due to moving pigs inside, some of it's genetics, um, um, certainly feed management, and 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 to an extent, even the 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 yields out on the in the fields. So you go from 60 bushel corn to 240 bushel corn. Um, there's a lot less land used per per pig or per thousand pigs. Depends on how you want to measure it, but it, it's kind of the same measurement. Um, so just you know, our our land use requirements have decreased dramatically. Our water use has gone down. And, at, and as we keep, um, keep looking at that, one, one of the big things that, that, we, that we're doing with our Pork Cares Farm Impact Report and, and aggregating that data is, is we are capturing the data from the farmers that we're doing right now so we can take credit for things we have been working on over the past 60 years to improve our bottom line. So, so, so that's, that's, the whole, that's the whole reason we're doing it is to allow us to start taking credit for all the good that we have done. As I look at some of the, the national roll-ups that I've seen, um, the, the highlight to me is an 80% reduction in soil erosion for farms that use swine manure versus those that are using commercial fertilizer. 80% reduction in soil, soil erosion. I, 
if, if you can't sit out there and, and trumpet those kinds of numbers, um, and you know, that, that's, that's some of those fun things to be able to see. I want to engage our audience a little bit to answer that question, if you don't mind. So uh, this is my third month with the Port Board. Um, so I'm, I want to ask the, the, the crowd here, how long has the pork industry had a sustainability program? Brad. There's very rarely a conflict between our... I would argue that there's very rarely a conflict between our natural economic targets and sustainability. So every time we're looking to save money on nutrients or increase our productivity, it fits very perfectly with what our consumer is asking for in terms of sustainability. So I would argue the industry has been doing it forever. You took my thunder. <laughs> uh, so my next question was going to be, <laughs> what's, what, what, when you think of one word about sustainability, what do you think about that in the pork industry? Efficiency. Efficiency? That's my most favorite word. Anybody else? <clears throat> so let's go back to my first question. How long has the pork industry had a sustainability program? Forever. Yep. So. So uh, that's the point that I want to make. My definition of sustainability is two things. One is it is not a destination, it's a journey. And it's a continuous improvement journey. So that's my definition of sustainability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, we, we kind of look at it in two different ways, right? Um, Tri-Oak as a contract system, we're trying to be the most efficient pork producer out there. Um, we want to make the, the correct decisions on DNA, on feed stuffs to get that most performing pig that, that we can economically do. But then we also have the, the story of, of bringing the, the son back home or the daughter back home to, to help with the farming operation, expand that farming operation um, and, and you know that, that family farm life uh, that so many of us are involved in. We saw, we saw in, um, I got to go out and visit the Microsoft headquarters, I guess, right before the pandemic. And um, amazing, um, amazing site. Um, very you know, sprawling, but a lot of investment in terms of, and commitment also even to, um, I suppose, carbon neutral and right. all these types of things. Is that something that, that is discussed a lot within the organization? Is it a different group that manages it or how does that? So actually, we from our team, given our focus being agri industry and agriculture, sustainability research, right, we actually collaborate with that group, which is sort of uh, managing the commitment right, that Microsoft has made to sort of go zero carbon emissions till by 2030 and by 2050, like remove all the carbon that we have ever emitted as a company. Uh, and so a lot of the investment also is in science to say how can we even validate and get some of these practices done so that you can have uh, you know, better sustainability just as a world, not necessarily just for Microsoft. Uh, so one of the areas that our team focused on was can we sort of figure out, so there are these process models that compute you know, how much carbon is sequestered in the soil, right? Can we use technology to sort of help uh, some of the inputs that it needs? So you can sort of now create a simulation of saying, what if I did this or that in the next couple of years? How does that impact how much carbon I will sequester uh, in the ground? Because we all know that you know th this is a place where you can you know remove carbon from the atmosphere. Yeah, and that's I think that's going to be one of the most exciting areas. Yeah, we can get to that that stage. Um, but quite a commitment. I haven't actually uh, realized that piece of, of removing all the carbon that you've ever emitted. Uh, it's quite a commitment. Um, so maybe maybe switching gears a little bit. Um, you know, one of the things that's kind of free, we've we've heard, and I I I spent six years in China, and their um, food security really was national security, and I think that that's something that is starting to become a topic. Uh, we discussed a bit in, in, in Hungary as well, where you know prices have gone up. Um, we were noting that the, the, the good news was the food inflation was only 30% uh, in, in May because it was 40% in April. Um, so pretty staggering. And you know, when you start to see issues like that, 
obviously other issues in society come up. Um, so when we think about that, you know, what is the role? You know, we're in, we're in the U.S. We have a different system. Um, but but when when that food security, national security are so linked, what is the role of, of government, perhaps, especially when we start to think about biosecurity issues? Who wants that one? <laughs> Just throw it out there, huh? <laughs> You know, the United States really has been blessed with being food secure, and and I know the people in this room are committed to maintaining that. Um, it, I think I think it's kind of incumbent upon us at that point, on a geopolitical basis, to um, to do the same for the Western he Hemisphere, mm -hmm. to um, to do what we can to make sure that those in the Western Hemisphere are food secure and. Um, and, you know, we all have the altruistic um, view that, that we're here as farmers to, to feed the world. And, and while that's the case, I, th I think it's most important to um, supply, supply a, a, a high, high quality, high protein food that, that they can eat and, and help support all the, the, the brain functions and and developmental needs for, for the kids around the world? I think from a biosecurity perspective, they play a paramount role in keeping ASF out of the United States. Um, and that's, you know, the port boards we've got a lot invested in being prepared for that, but I sure hope we don't have to use any of what we're learning to prepare for that. Um, I think uh, another role that, that, that the government plays and the port board is, is playing is re reimagining and retelling or telling a better story about the nutrition of pork. It, pork has not a good story around nutrition and, and the Port Board is, is investing a lot of money in how do we begin telling the, the true, we're calling it surprisingly pork. Mm -hmm. So how, how do we begin surprising folks in a, in a, in a very nice way about just how nutritious pork is, how can we get it in the school lunch program? How can we get it, how can we get doctors to quit saying, quit eating pork, for instance? That was, that was good. Like during the pandemic, I guess I never went and saw a doctor, so I had pork like every day. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much my go to. Um, so, but, but bringing it back into the sustainability lens, you know, I think part of that too is just you know, how do we leverage the technology we have? Mm -hmm. You know, BJ, does, when you're pitching your technology, is that, you know, is that sustainability piece part of the part of the puzzle, or is it something yeah. that's kind of a? Yeah, absolutely, part of it. I, I so through my lens is that I, I guess go back to the velocity uh, statement from the beginning. Like, it's the rate of new learnings times the application of the learning. And so I think as it relates to, to sustainability, point back to efficiency, continuous improvement, continuing to drive it efficiency, that starts with new learnings and applying those new learnings. And so our, our perspective is how do we, how do we get that new, the, the new learning into our hands to apply as fast as possible? And again, it goes back to digitization of data. Mm -hmm. And so you know, I think about some of the things, some of the levers that the industry pulls today, we may not have the answer to that result for six months or a year or several years, um, and so that's kind of how we've had the conversations with producers: is what what are the th what are the timelines that you want to accelerate that you want an answer to to drive efficiency? It's, it goes back to velocity. Start the flywheel. Let's let's generate new insights and apply them as fast as we can. And I, th I think that is done digitally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, so actually, the Pork Board and Alltech are both partners um, with the UC Davis uh, Clear Center. Um, I was kind of surprised, I have to say. We went out, and you often think, I don't know if anyone's familiar with uh, Professor Frank Midloner. Um, UC Davis has done a huge amount of work, but mainly beef and dairy, uh, looking at particularly things like methane, the methane cycle. Um, and so we get out to this meeting, and who's there but the Pork Board? And I was quite mm -hmm. impressed with that. It might be interesting just to maybe build on why that decision was made. Dale, I guess you were in the room when, when they decided that they would take some money and put it towards that. And then what does that mean? You know, when I think of a cow, I think of methane. When I'm thinking of a pig, what is it that, that we can achieve with a group like that? 
Well, our, our decision was um, how can we strategically invest some money in a, in a way to communicate out our sustainability message to, to a broader scale. Um, one, one of the ways that we looked at doing it was you know, just build our own network among universities and, and do that and model it after what Dr. Midloner has done at, at the Clear Center. And then we said, why model? Maybe partner, be more efficient, and, and started conversing with him. Find out that, you know, coming from Germany, his, his first studies were in monogastric animals. So, so he was excited to start working with, with the pork board. Um, took a little bit of development to do it, and um, but but the, our key thrust working with them is to help develop people to be communicators for what for the for the benefits of pork production. So it, it was going to be more on the, uh, his his work is more on the communications level. Um, we just signed a. We agreed to a deal. Do we sign it with Iowa State for the? It's not signed yet. It's, it's not wait, signed. Okay. Approval. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We're in approval process um, of, of working with a, a consortium of of universities to more deeply study the and, um, the emissions and and items like that on the gas emissions. And I'll hand it over to someone that 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 does does this a little bit more. My chauffeur. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any of the clear students? Clear Center students in the room? Yeah, I knew there were some here. Yeah, there are some here. So if you do see one, I encourage you to take a minute and engage with them because they can tell you a two minute elevator speech about themselves and what they're doing in a very clear, crisp way. It's amazing. So that is one of the reasons why we're engaged is because their ability to communicate. The other thing is, from my perspective, well, two things. One is, based upon what we've seen, what a, what a better thing to do than to have a California-based university tell important story today, yep. right? And then the other thing is, um, Dr. Mittlerner, you know, I, I, I encourage you to learn a little bit about him, but it's been 15 or 20 years ago, the United Nations Food and Ag Organization came out with uh, livestock's long shadow and blamed a lot of climate change on livestock. Dr. Mittlerner come out, he debunked it. So who better of a partner than to somebody that will stand up to the United Nations and say, you're wrong. Um, you know, it's kind of like for me, if I needed to hire an attorney, I want somebody that's going to be loud and proud about what the story of the industry is, just like I'd want somebody to be loud and proud to represent me personally. So. I'm pretty excited to have that group on board because they do a great job. Yeah, and I might bring it back to you, Brad. Um, yeah, because what, what I think is interesting, there's these students are not just learning the science, but they're learning the communication um, and, they're, and the communication skills. They're all very savvy in terms of social media use and really impressive. Um, but maybe back into the sustainability kind of with all of this discussion, Brad, what do you see as kind of for your operation, for your producers, you know, that can be valuable and, and, and what can the pork board or companies like ours uh, do to better support you? Yeah, I think, you know, streamlining that technology is going to be, be key. Um, and so, and then, then assisting with scalability. You know, we're really good about getting a pilot project started and, and even ramping it up to a small scale, but, but to actually roll it out to several hundred uh, different sites out there, just it, it becomes a, a scalability challenge and issue um, where you need a whole bunch of labor to get it scaled up and then you don't need it on the backside. And, and how, do you, how do you work through some of those you challenges? That. So I, I know we're, we're going to get to some audience questions, so be thinking about those. Um, but one of the things we like to do in Alltech is we like to ask, um, because we're an optimistic, positive company, uh, what people are optimistic about. Uh, so I might just do a, a quick rundown the line. Um, you know, who, what, are you, what are you excited about? What are you optimistic about, uh, about the future? I think uh, technology is going to help change and you know, make all industries, you know, ag agriculture and livestock being one of them, to sort of be more efficient and get, uh, get more produce out of the less, more for less. Um. I think I'm just excited to be, uh, I, I think 
coming back to the Park Expo, it's my favorite, it's favorite event of the year for sure. And just, I think seeing the familiar faces and, and people that you see them through the good times and the bad times and people still have pep in step and still want to solve problems and still are trying to drive efficiency um, regardless of what, you know, how that comes. Um, so I, I think, I think that I guess I'm confident in, the, in just the resilience and the mindset of the industry to keep pushing through. Yeah. Yeah, and I'd say, you know, I'm very optimistic about the technology that's that's still to come. I mean, felt like there was a time there um, that the technology was kind of stagnant. And then what's happened here in the last three, four years, um, you know, BJ's company and, and several other players out there that are, are really trying to, to move that ball and, and, and start to get us where we can get uh, some good solid technology on farm, getting data, um, and so we can make educated decisions. Yeah. I think uh, my optimism is from a pork perspective, from a pork board's perspective, my, my, and my perspective is pork leads the way when it comes to telling a sustainability story. Um, the, for years, this has been in the making. This, this, the ability to tell our story and to be able to lead way out in front of animal proteins and as we come out of this, continue to lead uh, forward with meeting, where, meeting consumers where consumers are at because that's what they want. Um, very short term basis. I'm excited to get back home and start side dressing corn. Because <laughs> I spent the last couple of days down here in meetings. Um, but, but longer term and overall, um, excited about the fact that, that our industry is still very diverse. We were, were able to welcome so many different um, sectors and, and work with them all. And there, there is a bright future. Um, having an opportunity to talk to our, our pork scholars from 22, and then like you said, the, the students here from, from UC Davis right now. Uh, there's, there's still a lot of excitement in the pork industry, and you know, we've, we've got, we, we can harness that power. Now while there may be the, 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 we may need the ability to have technology to assist us in sensing some of the things because we have less labor in the barns or whatever the situation is. But there is strong potential for, for what can be done. Yeah, I think as we get this technology implemented, it, it opens up so many new opportunities. It'll open our eyes, really, I think, to what the potential is. That's pretty, that's pretty exciting. So, um, Mark, I, I think the way this works is, is you walk around uh, you see if somebody has a question. If they don't, you have to think of a question. Well, I, we've, we've had a couple come in that producer have, producers have texted us as well. But if you've got one, raise your hand. The first one that, that I'm going to launch to get us off on a pretty lively debate is to BJ and Brad. Who pays? Who pays for technology? <laughs> Especially given the, the nature of our supply chain in the pork industry with the contract grower model very prevalent. Who pays? Yeah, that's a... That's a blurry one for sure. Uh, you know, part of it is, is who benefits on it. You know, from the, the feed standpoint, the technology that we've used there, we've been able to, to justify some of that cost. Um, but long term, do you, you know, is it a partnership? I think, you know, the, the model that we would look at right now would most likely be a partnership if there's value provided back. Um, you know, as far as some of the other things though, if it's not providing value back to us that we can actually grab a hold of, then it's probably on the, the producer be the way that we're sitting up today. Yeah, I think it, I guess from my perspective, would like calling on Brad to see, like to sell Brad, you know, our technology. I, I think um, it's just so much different than a traditional B to C selling Xbox or something, you know, it's, or selling a computer. It's, you're selling one to an individual who's going to use that product. Uh, and so you could bring technology to Brad, and Brad might use it, and 17 other people might use it too. And, and that kind of goes back to my, my point I was making earlier about getting in a room with an entire production team. Those 17 people might all use it, but whose budget does it hit? Mm -hmm. You know, like I think we, we face those battles too, and I'm sure you, you're all in those discussions. And, and so, I, you know, it, you, you, the person that pays is the one that directly benefits the most, and, and it's helped us to simplify the offering. Okay. I think really simplify 
a, a lesson for us was was starting too pie in the sky, thinking this is the this is the silver bullet for everyone, uh, and and that made it complicated because the organization is complicated. Um, so simplifying simplifying the offering, finding that that you know individual or part of the organization that directly benefits today, knowing full well there may be more in the future or or other partners. I think I think that's been a key thing for us too is. You know, implementing technology and then finding other partners who may who may benefit uh, from that down the road too also helps. It yeah. also helps. Brad. And one thing I was going to say is, you know, the most successful technology that we've implemented has been a, a, a three-party implementation where we're, we're partnered with a, a BJ of the world, we're partnered with the producer, so that we can all kind of help drive that yep. decision making and, and efficiency. Because at the end of the day, um, most all of this technology is providing value at multiple levels. Um, like you said, it's who's getting most value of it, but also where can we where can we help drive this technology so that we benefit down the road. Andy. So Mark, um, <clears throat> this is more of a general statement um, back to sustainability, carbon offsets, insects. Um, we've been working on this for probably two, three years and um, the only agricultural process <clears throat> that's verified and validated is methane digestion for dairies. We know for a fact uh, with our farming operations utilize a pig manure. So when you move 1% organic matter in the soils, it takes 16 tons of carbon sequestered to do that, 16 tons. And a lot of our farms you know, we're moving them from three to five percent. But we need help within the registries, mm -hmm. within the process, to be able to verify that and be able to market those carbon credits. Because that system is not there today. And the registries are extremely difficult to work with. So we need a farmer friendly process to take credit for the sustainability that we're creating today. Yeah, I think that's a big topic. I don't know if anybody has any expertise in that because the, the whole carbon market in general is, yeah, it's a bit the Wild West right now. Um, it is a little Wild West. We, we have a couple, uh, at least one project around um, some, some, some gene editing. Yes. Um, where we're working to how do we set up the process with the registry to do that. So I think, I think that that's... Um, probably some space for the port board to be thinking about how do we help find those pathways to get the, that, that done because the carbon market is the wild, wild west. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so Dale, I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit perhaps and um, maybe Jamie and anybody else. But um, on my way across the fairgrounds this morning, I happened to run into Dr. Gordy Spronk. And um, the conversation that uh, Gordy and I had revolved around what is a big issue, he would argue, sustainability both on individual farms as well as across our industry as compared to other exporting nations. And that's PERS, or disease, health level, right? That's what makes an individual farm uncompetitive. And uh, Gordy argued that that's the single biggest factor limiting U.S. pork from being competitive throughout the world. So you alluded to earlier about um, AgView as possibly being one of the tools to use um, in uh, helping control, if not eradicate, that disease. Um, but I, I phrased it with Dr. Spronk this morning, you know, that he's going to try to eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? That's a pretty big, yep. pretty big animal to try to um, bite into. And um, the, one of the biggest limitations that he will face is buy-in, I think, from the industry. Um, and I, I, I foresee that as being a challenge for him and his effort. But I'm thinking that it maybe starts with the pork board. Um, if, if he doesn't get buy-in on that concept, and, and he is one of the latest members to the National Pork Board, if he doesn't get buy-in at the national board level, then it probably isn't going to go anywhere either. So I, I invite your comment on that. 
Well, a little inside peek is we're kind of at a um, kind of a tipping point of what we actually do with AgView, um, and it, and it it takes those kinds of conversations, it takes that kind of input of do we continue to strongly invest, hold it in house, and build in those kinds of enhancements, or is it something that can be done through through a third party that that still provides the the minimum product that is needed for um, whether you call it traceability or or just movement you know, tracking of movements and all that, and then any add-ons for disease ad eradication would be handled by someone else. That those are those are decisions that we have just started to, to nibble at, and um, you know I, I know in the next three to six months we'll we'll start to get through it pretty well. So I don't have the exact answer. You laid out the question very well, Brad. So um, <laughs> there, there was not too many more comments I could add. <laughs> I think I'll, I'll just add back to an earlier comment. One way to get there potentially is gene editing. And what we have to do as a port board is begin trying to tell that story that is more palatable than GMO. So that, that's where we're at, is how do, how do we start telling that story before that technology gets here so that we're ahead of that potential pushback from other countries? Is that CRISPR kind of technology? Or is I'm sorry? It, is it kind of CRISPR, or is, it, is that what you're... Um, I, I, honestly, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yes. Yes. Sorry, Mark, do we have somebody over here? Was there another question? Yes, there is another question. Go ahead. Um, when we think about bringing the technology, integrating it into the farm, you all represent different place in the system, right? What are the low hanging fruit? Where do we start? I'll, I'll start with that. One, I, think, I think one area that we start is all these control systems that we have in barns, we need them to be able to talk to one system so that we don't have to have tech, control system um, um, separate technology. So we don't have to, all right, Dale, you have this controller, so you have to have yep. this suite of, of sensors. You have this set of, you have this controller, so you have to have, so we've got to figure out a way to work with the control companies to say, you know what, I understand your technology and your IP, but for the betterment of the producer, we really need to get to this point where there's one way to talk. Maybe our Microsoft friends could help us with that. Yeah, and that's basically what we're trying with the <laughs> data manager for agriculture is to get all of these so different sensors could be putting their data in the same shape that others can use. I, without it being complete commercial for distinct, I, I mean, it's <laughs> 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 uh, pretty much what we do. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, it's really centered around the democratization, all right? Use, use the device you want. I, I, my perspective is there are a thousand questions that pop into our head every day, and there's a device that exists. It exists. We don't need to invent another device that's purple or one that's blue. Like, the device exists. The way the, the question is in our head, democratize it, let the question be answered. And, that, and that's really kind of at the bottom line, that's what our, our message is, is establish that, establish that floor on which precision technology can be deployed. Yeah, and maybe just because um, we're in commercial mode, no, because this is actually a question we've had. Um, you know, you think about some of this biosecurity stuff, we actually partnered with uh, our, our aforementioned friend, Gordon, uh, on a technology basically around biosecurity. And one of the questions we've had is who should pay for this? Because it's actually, a technology in that that we can reduce diseases, make sure the feed isn't a path that isn't isn't a vector, um, but you know that's again reducing a risk. It's the opposite of an opportunity, um, and it's almost something that I've I've had the idea that we should go talk to the government because it's really a biosecurity issue for, from a, from that perspective. So um, some of you've seen great results, and how do you get these things moving? Is a big question. Good. Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. Uh, just had a question, probably more for BJ and Brad, re regarding infrastructure of our facilities, barn layout, pen design, uh, different things like that. Is there, I know BJ, you mentioned one of the roadblocks was connectivity for the infrastructure for new technology. Is there anything we can be exploring or you guys have ideas that 
from a barn layout, pen layout, that can be advantageous for adapting these new technologies. You know, one thing I, you know, kind of thought of just a little bit ago with, you know, feed being a vector for, you know, pathogens, biosecurity standpoint. Is there any way we can have bins be under a roof at some point? Or is there a different strategy rather than using feed bins, a different mode to get feed to pigs that we don't have to go out and negative 20 degree weather, bang on bins and get feed moving. Can that be a, under a roof? Don't have to shower and to go out and beat on the bins. Different things like that. Have you guys thought of how can we adapt our farm layout to be more advantageous for t new technology? I think that there are options there. Um, I think one thing that we have to keep in mind as we, we evaluate those options is do we impact performance of the animal while trying to do this? Um, you know, think back to to sort barns, um, for instance. You know, hey, there's great technology. We can sort the animals without without any human labor. Um, but did it affect performance? Um, so I think that's something that we need to evaluate further. But uh, we have to keep a balance there. I think the from an infrastructure standpoint, we we made a bunch of mistakes early well still continue but you know like you're always learning i think what we learned from our mistakes uh you know is thinking of, i i forgot about this barn is not the same as this barn or this barn is not the same as this and so that's really hard to apply when you think about scalability uh where you know a company's trying to launch a product that's scalable that can be deployed across every farm across the world um, and so when you, when every farm generally is different really i know we have a standard set of blueprints sometimes but Sometimes there's something in the way, <laughs> and and it doesn't always go to plan. So I think that's what makes it hard too to deploy technology. Is people are trying to bring technologies that are completely scalable, and we run into something that's different. Um, that was when we first launched the uh, camera technology. Uh, took that into a barn. Thought we were going to have this. Uh, uh, you know, the barns that I'd been into. Uh, you know, I, that's what I had pictured in my head. And I went into this barn. It was completely open rafters. I was like, oh, okay. Well, this is toast. <laughs> you know, we're <laughs> we'll, we'll go home. Um, so I think there's there's different things, you know, that that just impact that. And then the piece about the internet, uh, um, you know, your question there. When we tried to the first farm we went to uh, with a solution, they didn't have internet, and we thought, okay, this will be easy. We'll work with the local telecom um, to get you know internet to the site. Um, and I actually worked for a, a, a telephone company when I was in high school because it was the best paying job um, in Royal Iowa. And I thought, oh, this is great. I know this, I know this, this is a good gig. And we, we called up the small town phone company and they charged $4,500 to get the internet to the farm. And, and we're like, okay, well, I mean, that is the ROI death. Um, yeah. It's just toast. And so I think that was where we started to think about, okay, there's an infrastructure problem, not just like, not beyond barn layouts and differences like that, but thinking, okay, we have to take the burden of, of easing, easing adoption and, and be, making technology scalable. We have to take that burden away from the producer or the technology uh, deployment and adoption just dies. Yeah, that's a huge, it's a huge question. Do, Andy, do you have another question back there? Oh, okay. So, um, well, we might just, just, uh... oh, we got a question. Uh, fantastic panel. There you mentioned about the benefits of using manure, right? Mm -hmm. fertilize, fertilize the crops. Uh, by then, the, the crops, the grains, make up the biggest portion of the environmental footprints of, of pork, right? Probably over 50, 60%. And we see a lot of programs on the grain side where companies are helping the growers to generate carbon credits and sell those credits to companies like Microsoft, for instance, or others. In that case, you are not going to be able to claim those benefits or those improvements and tell the story of reducing environmental footprints of pork. So how the pork industry, how you guys are looking to that challenge, do you see us in the future competing with those companies for buying those credits, how, how, how that's going to work? Oh, you teed that one up like a softball. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I say that because I've been involved in the Climate Smart Commodity Grant that Pork Board is rolling out right now. 
Um, we were able to team up with Ducks Unlimited. Um, SEC is our reporting partner. And then we also got financial investment from Nestle. Um, as, and we're doing things, um, some of the practices we're looking at are kind of, the, I'm just going to call it the standard, but everyone's kind of doing the cover crop, no-till. Um, we're looking at changing out, you know, doing the additional change out of light bulbs to LED bulbs and, 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 and offsetting a lot of that, or giving a grant money for a lot of producers to be able to do that. The, and at that point, the carbon offset that would be there is actually an inset because it goes to Nestle as part of their, their food shed. Um, the, think the DiGiorno Pizza and I uh, can't remember the lasagna brand, but it's a big one too. So, so they, they use a lot of pork. Um, and, and one of the other innovative ones is the fact that we've gone to um, two-time removal per, per year of manure out of the manure storage. And, and that one, with the amount that we're paying, is calculated to be pretty close to the equivalent of $64 a ton for carbon. So, you know, we actually came in pretty good on, on that one. That was, that was pretty surprising. Um, right now, this is available, as the grant is written right now, is available in Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri. Um, we're looking at ways to um, extend some of the additional Nestle obligations to roll it out to other states. And I think to, to, to your question, too, is we've got to be able to give, them, give producers options so that either they can maintain the asset and we get to share and pull through that, the, the attribute um, and, and the supply chain can share in the story of the inset. So, so I think we've just got to be able to give that option. So either like in Dale's deal, Nestle gets the credit or in another, another way, Dale would get to keep the, yeah. the, the credit, the asset, and then just right. pull through the attribute. It's a, it's a big topic and I think it's one that, that you know, there's all sorts of questions. Altic recently made an acquisition of a business called Agalin, um, mainly on the, the beef and dairy side, but there's applications as well uh, on the pork side, and, and we're looking at that, and that's one of the big questions. People are already using the product. There's national governments that want the credit for these types of things. There's you know, obviously offtake partners, and then there's ag itself, and I think one of the things we have to make sure we do is protect ourselves and not, not suddenly create a bunch of offsets and pass them on to somebody else. And, we're still uh, in a bad spot. So I want to just um, quickly thank Mallory, uh, Lori also who, who ran out the door. She even brought us a panelist. Uh, so there's always uh, those other people that really do all the work in these types of things. And I get to sit up here and take the credit. Uh, but it's really them that, that do the hard work. Um, also, the Pork Board um, and the uh, National Pork Producers Council has been great in terms of the collaboration. And maybe join me in, in thanking our speakers for being with us today. Thank you. <laughs> We are going to have uh, some of those aforementioned uh, drinks outside at the tent. Uh, lunch is also on us, uh, so do come by the tent just out on the other side. We also have our booth, so we, we look forward to continuing the conversations uh, there. Thank you.